Thank you so much. You know, one of the joys of serving here is I get to hear this music twice. Uh, I have been in some churches where I've had to hear the music twice, and I was just calling for Jesus to return quickly. Uh, but uh, the, the music here is just great, and we are blessed again and again. Well, I want to take you to a really interesting passage of Scripture. It comes from Hebrews chapter 6. There's a section in the middle of it that is a section that has gotten a lot of people flustered and a lot of people fighting and a lot of people arguing, and we're just not even going there. But I'll just allude to it briefly as we pass by. And, uh, but there is something rich and profound in here where we can all find God's grace. Now, I'm going to do something a little different this uh, with the sermon today, in that I'm going to be talking about three stories from history, and I'm going to add on to those three stories from the Bible and overlap them, take you to a different passage of Scripture, and then come back to this one. So I'm going to ask you to listen carefully because you're going to have to hold on to this, and we'll come back to it in a little bit, but it's all moving into this very same place. Chapter 6, verse 1. So, let us stop going over the basics of Christianity again and again. Let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. Surely we don't need to start all over again with the importance of turning away from evil deeds and placing our faith in God. You don't need further instruction about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And so, God willing, we will move forward. Will you say those words with me? Move forward to further understanding. For it is impossible to restore to repentance those who were once enlightened, those who have experienced the good things of heaven and shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the power of the age to come, and who then turn away from God. It is impossible to bring such people to repentance again, because they are nailing the Son of God to the cross again by rejecting Him, holding Him up to public shame. When the ground soaks up the rain that falls on it and bears a good crop for the farmer, it has the blessing of God. But if a field bears thistles and thorns, it is useless. The farmer will condemn that field and burn it. Okay, let me just pause here. That passage in, chapter, in verses 4 through 6 especially, where it says if somebody has listened to God and then fallen away, there's no way for them to come back because they've nailed the Son of God to the cross again. Well, this is ripe for much argument. There are some folks who say, aha, see, there's biblical proof for backsliding. And others say, no, they just weren't saved in the first place. And they'll get into big rhubarb about that. And can they be saved? Can anybody who's fallen away come back again? Well, there's a big uh, rhubarb about that too. What I want to say is we're not even going near there today because here's what we can all agree on. Well, let me ask you the question. Do you think anybody ought to try to fall away from God and see if they can come back again? No! All of us agree, that just doesn't make any sense. All of us can agree wholeheartedly, we need to stay faithfully following after Jesus. But we are given here a very stern warning and ought not miss that. And then he continues on in verse 9, says, Now, dear friends, even though we're talking like this, we really don't believe that it applies to you. Now, we're confident that you are meant for better things things that come with salvation. For God is not unfair. He will not forget how hard you've worked for Him and how you've shown your love to Him by caring for other Christians, as you still do. Our great desire is that you will keep right on loving others as long as life lasts in order to make certain that what you hope for will come true. Then you will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. Say that with me. Spiritually dull and indifferent. Instead, 
you will follow the example of those who are going to inherit God's promises because of their faith and patience. God, give us ears to hear today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'm going to ask a question here to start off. We're going to, I'm going to give you three pictures that we're going to hold on to through our whole time today. And I'll bet that even our young ones know the answer to this. Who is the most despised creep in the American Revolution? We still remember his name, and when we hear it, we go, yuck. He betrayed our country. Does anybody remember his name? Benedict Arnold. Have any of you even considered naming your children Benedict Arnold? No, you're not even going near there. He was, for a time, a great uh, officer in the Army for the United States. But then, at a critical moment, he turned his back on our country, betrayed our country, and went back over to the side of the British. From what I understand, even the British, once he got back to Britain, despised him. No one likes a traitor. He started off one way, but then he lost his vision and lost his way. Benedict Arnold. Now, Here's a second one. Now, this story is about uh, a German uh, battleship. It's called the Bismarck. It was built in 1939, beginning of World War, right at the beginning of World War II, and uh, was enormous, 273 meters long. Think three football fields. And this thing was huge and was uh, certainly one of the most powerful ships that had ever been built up to that time. Well, it had one successful battle, which it, it sank the uh, HMS Hood that belonged to Britain, and then it, just, it did severe damage to another ship, and they, the other ship retreated. Well, the British were infuriated about this, sent out an aircraft carrier to look for it. Two days later, they found the Bismarck, and they launched some planes with torpedoes to uh, try to uh, attack the Bismarck. Well, they launched their torpedo. It didn't really do much until the last guy was left to add a couple of torpedoes. Now, I want to ask you, I don't know how to fly, and I'm, I'm sure it's challenging, but don't you just think you could hit something the size of three football fields? You know, I'm just thinking, you got to work to miss. He almost did. I mean, the last guy dropped his torpedoes. They almost missed. Actually, they hit the very, very back of, of the uh, battleship and really didn't do a lot of you know, damage like to sink the boat. It just did one thing. It destroyed its steering mechanism. And so the Bismarck, this powerful battleship, just started making giant circles in the ocean. It couldn't steer anywhere except to go in circles. And the British brought their navy and destroyed the battleship. It was just going around in circles. And then a third, also a German, except an outstanding German general. His name was um, Erwin Rommel. Does anybody remember his nickname? The Desert Fox. Okay, for those of you who are World War II fans, you'll recognize the name. He was a brilliant general. Most of his campaigning was done on the northern tier of Africa. He had a tank battalion and was just astonishing in the way he could strike at places unexpectedly and 
how quickly he could move to somewhere else and when people came after him where he used to be he was gone he was just a, a remarkable person and won many many battles for Germany but do you know what finally defeated the great desert fox he ran out of gas literally <laughs> his tanks ran out of gas he was not defeated by superior power he wasn't defeated by great tactics by the enemy he ran out of gas so let's just talk about three stories from the Bible that may have some parallels along the way now remember who was our first guy Benedict Arnold here was a guy who started out but right direct, but he just lost his way well I think about somebody from the life of Jesus one of his disciples anybody got a guess Judas I mean here's a guy who started out I mean, as far as we can tell he was just like all the other disciples but somewhere along the line he lost his way and where he had been for Jesus some way he turned against him he just lost his way I, I think too about um, Paul who had a friend by the name of Demas okay this is a moment remember we're in church and in honesty here how many of you remember the name of Demas from the Bible okay well at least you're being honest there are, okay there are a few of you Demas only shows up in three verses so if you don't remember Demas it's for good reason and the only thing we know about Demas in two of those he shows up in three letters of Paul at the end of the, each letter and in two of them he's named with some other guys he says, oh, I've got some great friends so and so and so and so and Demas you know how he shows up the third time it's this he says well Demas has deserted me because he loved the world there's a guy who just lost his his course he was headed in the right direction he just lost his way well then we have the guys who are uh, I uh, remember the, the story of the Bismarck what was the problem with them going in circles and I'm just thinking the Pharisees you know the Pharisees were good people now a lot of times we give them a bad rap but they were you know they were good folks and you'd have been glad to have them as your neighbors but the problem was they just got so focused on what they were doing for God that they forgot to stay in love with God and pretty soon they were doing all the right stuff but there was no heart there pretty much they were just going in circles they were doing stuff but they weren't going anywhere and then we have the third one and that was Erman Rommel and what was his problem ran out of gas anybody here understand about that I mean does anybody here know that sometimes we just run out of gas well here's the guy that I think of when I think of that and that's Solomon Solomon was a guy who um, what do we remember him as wise that's right because Solomon uh, he inherited from his father David the kingdom of Israel and it, it was all set for its glory days and they really were the glory days during Solomon's time God said to him Solomon ask me for anything you want and Solomon asked for wisdom which is a really good thing but then Solomon got involved with way too many women um, God, I, mean, I love women you know but you ought to only love one uh, and in that kind of way anyhow but he got involved with way too many uh, women got involved with other gods got involved with uh, uh, amassing huge amounts of money and he got involved with horses and chariots which he'd been specifically told to leave those things alone now Solomon started off doing just great I mean he was really trying to follow God but what happened he just ran out of ran out of gas I mean he just was headed one way and then he just stopped and next thing you know he's drifting off into things that end up not building him up but destroying him okay we got the three things now you got Benedict Arnold 
you know, lost his way. We've got Judas and Demas. We've got the Bismarck, just going in circles. You know, we think about our Pharisees uh, there. And then, uh, last of all, we've got uh, Erwin Rommel, just ran out of gas. And we think of our friend Solomon. Okay, now. I want to think about another passage of Scripture. I'm not going to read this for you, but um, most of you will recognize this simple story. It's a parable that Jesus told. He said it's about a man who went out and he was sowing seed. Remember this one? We usually call it the parable of the seed. It really ought to be called the parable of the soils because the seed he throws out is the same seed everywhere. Not like he threw good seed here, bad seed there. It's same seed, same farmer. But as he's throwing out the seed, some of it falls onto a path. It's just hard as a brick, and it doesn't go in. It, it's a, and, and we could say this, this is the, the group that lost their vision. Just nothing happens there. Then it goes on to a second place, and some of the, the uh, seed falls into stony ground. Well, it starts growing and starts doing pretty well. But then there's no, you can't go down any deeper and it withers away because it doesn't have any root to it. And maybe we just think about these folks who uh, maybe we'd compare them to the ones who ran out of gas. And then the, the, the third one was the one where all of a sudden it grows up fine, but then thorns come and choke it out. And maybe these are the people who just, you know, they get involved with the things of the world and pretty soon they're going in circles, but they aren't going anywhere. Now, here is why I have entitled this, pass, uh, this sermon today, For Heaven's Sake, Don't Stop. How is it we get into this place where we just lose our direction? How do we get to the place where we're just going in circles? How, how do we get to the place where we just run out of gas? Well, let me take you back. For those of you who were not here last week, uh, those of you who were here last week, help me out with this. But we were talking about how we're not saved by our works, we're saved by God's grace. But John Wesley said here are three kind of aspects or stages of that grace as it comes to us. We have, first of all, the grace that is God beckoning us to Himself. It's before we're saved, but God's just reaching out to us. It's like when you're trying to win the love of the person you want to marry. And we call that prevenient grace. Will you say that with me? prevenient grace, okay? This is a grace that's calling us. Then we come to a place where we receive saving grace, or we might call it what John Wesley called it, was justifying grace. It sets us right with God. Justifying grace. Would you say that with me? Justifying grace. Okay, so we've got prevenient grace. Justifying grace. This is what we often talk about when we make a, a decision to follow after Jesus. Uh, and so this is vitally important. But he said there is one more, and that is sanctifying grace. Would you say that with me? Sanctifying grace. So we start with prevenient grace, justifying grace, and then sanctifying. What is sanctifying grace? It is what we live out for the rest of our lives. It is following Jesus day by day. Here is the problem. And sometimes we in the church have not been very clear about this, and we pastors have dropped the ball on this. We have told people, God loves you, and He wants to save you. And so we, people will come, and they may pray a prayer. They may come to the altar. They may have gone to a revival somewhere. Or they may be reading the Bible, and they make a commitment to Jesus. That is great. And when you do that, you are saved. But that's not the end of the journey. In many ways, it is the beginning of the journey. It's like going to, getting to first base. I mean, you can't go around the bases until you get to first base. But if you stay on first base, you'll never win the game. You want to make it all the way around. God, please help the Braves. <laughs> anyway, uh, but staying on first base isn't what, it, you know, that's not where it is. You've got to get to first base, but then keep on going. Keep on. For heaven's sake, don't stop. Many times we have preached, 
half the gospel. Half the gospel is God loves you and you can be saved. Well, that's right. Here's the rest of it. You can be changed. Because the whole rest of our life, God is at work to make us like Jesus. That's what his goal is for your life and mine. He wants us to be like Jesus. He doesn't want us to stop here and say, well, you know, I'm I'm saved, and now I can just go on my way. No. Once we're saved, we go on Jesus' way. Now, this passage from Hebrews 6, coming back here, uh, says that we ought to keep on going. Don't keep talking about the same stuff, you know, at the beginning. Grow up, move along, and it gives us a warning that one day we will be responsible for our actions and there will be judgment. Now, there's some folks who say, oh, God's just loving and he would never judge us. Listen, God is loving. Of course he is. First John says God is love. But part of love is justice. As a matter of fact, every Sunday, Diane leads us in the Apostles' Creed, and we say this. This is one of the basic tenets of our faith. It talks about Jesus, says, uh, rose again from the dead. From thence he shall come to what? Judge the quick and the dead. I mean, there it is. God holds us accountable. Now, here's the thing. God is giving us every opportunity. God is not small-hearted. He's not mean-hearted. He's not, uh, you know, sending people to hell and judging people like that. Rather, I want you to understand this very important thing about judgment. I'm going to use an example I feel a little badly about because, you know, I just don't want to drag a guy into the mud, but it's somebody you'll recognize and uh, maybe somebody that we can uh, understand what I'm getting at. Judgment is built into the sin. So when somebody does something evil, God doesn't just go, yeah, well, I'll show you. The judgment is built into the sin. And here's the example I'll use. And I I don't mean to drag this guy down because I've been praying for him. I hope you have been, uh, that God will help him to come to the truth. Uh, It's Tiger Woods. Tiger thought he could commit adultery and get away with it. And by the way, that is the stock in trade of the devil. He'll say, oh, come on, you can go ahead and do this. Nobody will ever know. I'm telling you, judgment is built into the sin. So, what happens with Tiger? You know, I mean, he loses his family, loses a bunch of money. He uh, loses his reputation. And he lost his golf game. How interesting. Now, God's not sitting up there judging and pointing a finger. The judgment is built into the sin itself. And so what the writer of Hebrews is warning us about is don't stop along the journey and just think, well, I can drift off into anything I want to. What happens is when we go into a way that is not God's way, we will receive the justice that comes from walking on that, in that way. And we tell our kids, be sure your sins will find you out. It is in the fabric of things. And so the writer of Hebrews here warns us, don't stop, go on to become what God wants you to be. He says, don't just stop with baby food. Have you ever heard anybody say, well, I left that church because I just wasn't being fed? Well, I want to ask you a question. In our human world, who waits around to be fed? Babies do. Adults feed themselves. So if somebody says, I just wasn't being fed, I want to say, grow up. Don't stop at babyhood. Grow up. 
learn how to feed yourself. So let me just end with two questions that I want to ask you to ask yourself. You're the only one that can answer these. Nobody can do this for you. But here is the clear application of what we have been talking about. Number one, will you evaluate yourself and are you stopped or are you growing? Are you, have you lost your vision? Are you going around in circles? Just run out of gas? Is there no spiritual life to you? I can't answer that for you. But I'm asking you to evaluate for yourself. Find out where you are. And if, by the way, you are out of gas or going around in circles or have just lost your vision, I have something important to say to you in just a moment. There's hope. Here's the second thing. Are you helping others grow? Are you helping others grow? One of the great things that we are finding is bringing great fruit in our church is in one-to-one -one Bible study where we are helping others to grow as we pass along what we have learned and we learn how to listen to God together. It's important for us to pass along. Matter of fact, we have a, a saying, you are not a disciple until you make a disciple. It's not just about learning stuff and saying, oh, I know so much. Are you passing it on? And remember who your first audience is. Moms and dads, your first responsibility is to your, uh, to your children. It's to your children. Grandparents, your grandchildren. Remember, are you passing on to them your faith that they n can see and know the reality of God's grace at work? Now, I want to just end with this. There was a guy named Mark. You may have heard of him. He wrote a book in the bestseller of all time it's called The Bible. Mark kind of had an inauspicious beginning. He was the nephew of a man named Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas went on the first missionary journey together. Barnabas, taking young Mark under his wing, remember how we were talking about how you're meant to pass it on? He took Mark with him. He said, well, let's help him to, this young guy, let's help him to grow in the faith. So they took him along. They got to their first stop, Cyprus. I don't know what happened there, if things were difficult or what, or if Mark just got homesick, but he left. And Paul and Barnabas went on the rest of their journey. They turned around, came back, and then they got ready after a while to go out for the second time. And who did Barnabas suggest that they take with them? His nephew, Mark. And Paul, we are not taking that quitter with us, loser. And Barnabas says, yeah, we are. No, we're not. Yeah, we I don't know exactly how that whole thing played out, but in the end, they got so mad at each other, Barnabas said, well, if he isn't going, I'm not going. Paul said, well, you just be that way. I'll get somebody else to go with me. And they split up. Now, here's the thing. At the end of Paul's life, he writes at the end of one of his letters, he said, and would you please ask Mark to come and see me? He's so useful and valuable to me. Isn't that great? Here's a young guy that he had sort of given up on, but thankfully... Somebody else had not given up on him, Barnabas. And Paul was gracious enough to realize he'd been wrong, and he reclaimed Mark too. I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, wherever you are today in your journey, that, that's where you are, there's nothing you can do about that, but you can change going forward. And today, you can take a new step with God, wherever you are. And God will help you day by day to become more and more like Jesus. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, the truth is, none of us has this perfect line going upward. 
to mark the way our life has been. We've all had ups and downs along our journey. Some of us today may say when we're evaluating ourselves, well, the truth is I've just lost my way. I, I've just lost my faith. I, I'm just sort of back at square one. Maybe there's somebody else who's saying, well, you know, I just feel like I'm going around in circles. I'm doing religious stuff, but there's no heart there. Then there may be some of us who just say, I, I'm just out of gas. Uh, I, I feel like I've just dried up. Well, the good news, my brothers and sisters, wherever you may be, if, if any of those scenarios describe you at all, God has a brand new future for you. You don't have to stay where you are. This very moment, would you just ask God, say, hey, would you help me? I, I don't want to be out of gas. I don't want to stay going in circles. I don't want to lose my vision. I want, to, I want my life to count. You know, if, if you're just praying that prayer right now, God's listening. And this very moment, He is doing something that is setting you free to a new life. You are making a commitment now that will take you into a whole new place to follow Jesus day by day by day by day. It's just about faithfulness. And God will be faithful to you. And then there may be some among us who we say, well, okay, I'm, I'm a growing Christian. I'm, I'm learning. But we haven't been passing along very much. Well, God, we want to pray that you would help us to pass along to someone we know, someone we love, maybe our own children or grandchildren, that, that we're dedicated to passing along what you have given to us. We love you so much, and today we honor you, and we thank you that you never give up on any of your children. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today, as we sing our closing hymn, uh, I want to just open the altar, and maybe you'd like to come here and pray for yourself, for somebody else, for someone you love. The altar's always available. Let's stand together as we sing, uh, Were You There? It's number 314. It'll be up on the screens. I'm sorry, in the garden. That's number 314, and uh, I got the number right. So let's stand as we sing together and praise the Lord. A great joy it is that God is with us in the journey. God is not sitting off in some place hollering instructions, cracking a whip saying, come on, try harder, work more. Instead, the journey is one we take with Him. All we have to do is walk with Jesus and follow Him step by step. That's a sure path to life. That's a sure path to growth. That's a sure path to faith. Won't you walk with Jesus today? And if you're just starting the journey, ask Him, and it will be a lifetime of delight.